in uh, contesting and DXing. So we'll get uh, started here in a moment. Looks like we have a great crowd. I'm uh, impressed with the number of people, and I understand we're being broadcast all over the place. So uh, I, that made me a little more nervous than I expected. So I've uh, been involved in, in uh, ham radio for many, many years. Actually, I just got my 50-year ARRL pin arrived in the, the mail the other day. So that was a big surprise. I didn't, time goes by fast. Time goes by fast. So I'm going to talk about uh, using uh, K9A loop, K9AY loop arrays and uh, building them and some of their characteristics. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, their use uh, in, in various contests. So I'll talk a little bit about me, and then we'll look at the uh, loops and uh, the optimization that uh, we're using. We'll talk about various arrays of them. And some of those are very good for DXing and, and less good for contesting. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, talk about some observations on their use and how they've performed over, over time. So my interests are low band contesting, particularly on 160 meters and 80 meters. Uh, I do a lot in the NAQP CW contest some in RIDI. I use these antennas to be able to hear on the low bands and typically to pick up a lot of extra multipliers on 80 and 160. Also work things like the Stu Perry and uh, the ARL, ARRL DX contest. And uh, just for example, recently I worked all the states without any trouble with low power and uh, the receive antennas on uh, 160. So they work well. Some time ago, I actually uh, won the sprint in Alabama. That's when there were only a few of us in Alabama, I think. There are a lot more Alabama operators there to compete with these days. And I've been doing a lot of DXing in the last uh, 20 years or so and uh, have uh, 255 countries worked on 160 and all zones on 80 through 10, 38 zones on 160. And 300 plus countries, most places. So uh, I work a lot now on the low bands. So I need to need to hear well on 180, on 80, <laughs> 160 and 80 meters, and I find it a big big de a big advantage in the NAQP and other DX contests. And f in my area. I've used both verticals, short verticals, and, uh, and loops, and I find the loops to be the most consistent thing. And I'm not quite sure why, other than the ground conditions are really bad in the part of Alabama that I'm in. Uh, it's red clay, and when it's dry, it's like concrete. Uh, you can't dig into it to save your life. You can't stick a pick in it hardly. The only way to dig in it is make it real wet. So I've used, uh, gone to K9AY loops at the antenna forum the last couple of years. I described uh, three element in fire array, which is my primary antenna at home at the moment, and uh, two element arrays. And my latest effort is uh, looking at uh, a four element array that is really better than uh, most uh, beverages in a, in a uh, uh, much shorter footprint. It's about... Uh, uh, what is it? 500 feet long, I guess. No, it's 350 feet long, I guess. 330 feet. It even tells me right there. I just <laughs> <laughs> Whose slides are these anyway? <laughs> and the RDF at that uh, is, is uh, 15 dB, which is really quite good. So we'll talk a little bit about all of those things. So trying to receive weak signals in... Uh, in these contests and as well as for DXing and trying to maximize the receiving discrimination factor, the RDF. And that's uh, something that W8JI came up with, <clears throat> which compares basically the forward gain to the gain in all directions. So your noise is coming in from everywhere. And 
so you uh, look at the average gain over the whole hemisphere of your array and then compare it to the forward gain. And in dB land, you subtract the two, and that gives you the RDF. And uh, so that's what I use since I'm worried about weak signal reception. That's what my optimization criteria is, is trying to optimize RDF. And the comparison here that I'll be making is to a short uh, vertical. This is a pattern of a 20-foot vertical. It's uh, omnidirectional, as you all know, for a vertical. And uh, its RDF is about uh, not quite 5 dB, roughly 5 dB. So that's what we're sort of comparing to. And uh, the loop I'm going to talk about is the K9AY loop shown here. It's pretty much of a, a, an equal lateral triangle, a little bit squashed, but uh, it's uh, 85 feet of uh, wire if it's designed, uh, the original design is 85 feet of wire for 160. And it's uh, terminated in one end and the feed line is at the other end. These are normally very close to the, the grounding stake in the middle. It does need a ground in the middle. And the signal's arriving from the left-hand side here if the termination resistor is on the right-hand side. And then one of the advantages of that configuration is the termination and the feed point are right here, so it's very easy to switch directions by just switching the, the termination. Uh, Everything I'm going to say here applies pretty much to other kinds of loops, flags and pennants. Uh, the, the double half delta loop is a one a version of a two element array, and uh, so you can pick the uh, the your favorite loop and build these arrays out out of them. But this is very convenient for switching. Yeah, that's uh, designed for 160, that's correct. And there's the uh, overall pattern down there. And the first uh, thing you see here is the, the gain is a whole lot lower out of these loops. They're terminated loops, they're very lossy, and the output is low. The output on a relative scale was 1 dB on the vertical. It's minus 25 dB almost on this antenna. <laughs> but the main, th that doesn't really matter. You can put a preamp in there and uh, get the enough, plenty of signal without any problem. So this has an RDF that's uh, about 2.5 dB better than the, uh, the single vertical, and that's because it is directive. It's got a sort of a cardioid pattern uh, when you look at the uh, horizontal pattern. And uh, so it cuts off a lot of the, the gain to noise, if you will, in the reverse part of the antenna, and that's why it has a better RDF. And it's two and a half, and you can, two and a half dB better than a, a single vertical, and uh, it has good front to back, uh, relatively good front to back, and performs very well. Here's a slide that I, uh, I think this slide is the one I left out of the presentation that I added. You can see the, uh, the vertical pattern here. It has a notch in there, and uh, lots of times you see people plot the, uh, the front to back of, the, of this thing, and they, pr they plot it at this angle, because that's where it's best, where it's like 25 or 30 dB. But uh, I just prefer to, to look at the thing in the, the same uh, angle of arrival as I look in the back, backward direction. So there it's got about 10 or 12 dB here uh, front to back, which is very noticeable. Uh, and it's very interesting on the low bands to see how that comes into play if you're near um, sunrise or sunset and the, let's say sunrise, where to the east of me, the sun's coming up, and the noise is actually dropping off in that direction. And so the, the front to back also comes into play on improving the noise performance. Another important thing about this uh, 
uh, single antenna is that the uh, beam width is approaching 180 degrees here. So you have something that receives the whole 180 degrees almost with uh, not too much uh, degradation. And I'll, I'm going to talk to uh, talk about that because that's quite important when you're trying to use these antennas in in uh, contests. You need it's not rotatable, okay? So you need multiple ones of it if you're going to maintain the RDF. And in fact, I'll, I'll make this comment again that if you get, here's if you come around here and get to that to the uh, the 90 degree points on this antenna, you're down 3 dB or so. And so the gain has dropped 3 dB, and your RDF has dropped 3 dB in that direction. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind when you look at these antennas, that, that the, R, the RDF that's quoted is often the, 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 the best direction, and it deteriorates as you go away from that direction. So you can build arrays of these things, and the two element is very easy, and I'll spend some talk, time talking about it. Here's the three element and four element arrays. And first of all, I mentioned it before, these are lossy antennas, quite lossy. They use a res the resistive t termination, and when you get done, there's really little or no mutual coupling between these elements, which allows you to do things, it's not like a uh, 20 meter Yagi or something where there's a lot of mutual coupling. The whole Yagi works on mutual coupling. Here, there is very little mutual coupling between the elements. And so you can move them back and forth and adjust the phasing without worrying about the, the interaction between the loops. The other thing, the loops are very broadband. Um, the typical K9AY loop that I've measured is essentially flat to 20 megahertz. And uh, then, uh, then the SWR starts to deteriorate. But I use this thing on, on 10 meters when it's noisy. I've used it on 10 meters. I use it on 20 meters. On those bands, you have no idea what the patterns are. The patterns are terrible. But if you can hear the signal and its uh, signal-to-noise ratio is better, you might as well use it wherever it works. So on these that are designed for 160 meters, they typically work on 80 meters just fine, and then 40 meters, uh, there's the spacing is starting to become wide enough that the pattern's deteriorating. But I, I still use them on, for example, 30 meters a lot um, when I'm working DX. The output decreases as the number of elements increases. What you're really doing is you're killing the gain over most of the antenna to get rid of the noise. And so, it drops from 24 dBi to about minus 40 dBi, not quite minus 40 as you go from one to two to three to four elements. But you can always bring that back with, uh, with preamps. And uh, I found an in interesting uh, comment from one of the guys I work frequently on 160. He's on all the time. IV3PRK has very good signals out of uh, Italy. And his comment was, K9AY loops always seem to work. When you, you throw them up, and they work. And that's been my experience, too. And uh, uh, whereas uh, my first receiving antenna, I think, was a U. And that didn't work at all in Alabama, where I live, with concrete for the, the ground. Uh, it, worked, it worked fine if it just poured down rain but it requires just using the ground as a return path. Oh, mine, uh, mine are buried in my, in my yard in, in amongst lots of trees. I, I, I don't see any, any problem with them. Uh, performance seems fine with it uh, buried in the trees. And the question there was, can they be near the trees? So I need to repeat the questions I was instructed to. Um, so yeah, uh, they're very, I find them very forgiving, uh, very forgiving. So I wanted to look at the two element array and we'll come back to that as well later. You take two, 
two uh, antennas. They are fed with equal amplitude signals, or you, if you're looking at thinking of them in, in transmitting, you combine them with equal amplitude, equal amplitudes in a single phasing line. And I look at the rear element as lagging the front element, and to get a, the best RDF, the that uh, phase shift is typically greater than 180 degrees. Uh, 190, 200, 210, something like that. Um, very different from the design of a transmitting array where you usually, the phasing is typically adjusted to match the spacing in some sense. Uh, these are not. You, you uh, have a significant phase shift that is pretty much independent of how far apart they go are. In the uh, talk which you can find on the web that I gave last year, I guess, on the two element arrays. There's a lot of information in there on optimization of the spacing and, and choice of phase and things like that. I'm not going to deal with that in great detail here for the two element array. And the, uh, with the two element uh, phasing here of uh, 200 degrees and a spacing of, of 80 feet, then the RDF is about 10 and a half dB, which is a 3 dB improvement, a very significant improvement in signal to noise ratio um, on uh, receiving signals. And the beam width is about 96 degrees, and the worst case front to back ratio is 16.6 uh, uh, dB there with a takeoff angle of about 25 degrees. So it's, and, the uh, interest, one of the interesting things, I've made these and had them operate just fine with the loops almost end to end. So you can move these very close together. You can put them right end to end. And they still work uh, just, uh, just fine. You lose signals. One of the, the, the signal that you get out is the wider the spacing, the better the uh, signal, the better the output signal in general. So you do sacrifice signal, but um, you can build them in a relatively small footprint. And uh, the double half delta loop is sort of an example of that, where it's, it's very compact. And here's the uh, results on 160. Uh, there you can see the horizontal pattern up there on the, the uh, right-hand side. And here's the, uh, the vertical pattern. This is, again, with the same 80-foot spacing. And uh, again, the RDF is 10 and a half dB. You get around to the 45-degree points. It's down about 3 dB. So basically, in those directions, you're back to the performance of uh, the single loop in the you said 80 foot spacing. Any That's center to center. All these spacings are center to center. So it takes another 15 feet on each end the, each of these is about 15 feet from the center. So the, the width of the loop at the bottom is about 30 feet. And so uh, that's, uh, I showed the slide back a ways that had the four element array and it was 330 feet. So that's three units of 100 foot spacing and then 15 feet on each end for that four element array. Um, there's nothing sacrosanct about the size of these loops though. You can make them smaller, and they'll work. At some point, you lose signal to the point where they're not effective anymore. But you can make them actually smaller. And I actually did that once. Some of these, the two, the three and the four element arrays have a sort of a one, two, one, or one, three, three, one amplitude uh, distribution on them. And uh, so one of the things I, that actually work, but I don't, don't use it anymore because it's, it's very high to, hard to make it uh, exactly right, is uh, I scaled the area of the antenna to get the factor of two uh, in amplitude. So, but that takes some, some measurement to make sure it's right. So the two element array gives you a big improvement in RDF. And uh, um, it really uh, works very, very well. And it's very forgiving 
very forgiving with uh, relative to amplitude errors and, uh, and uh, phasing errors. Very forgiving. Very forgiving. So here's the three and four element versions. Um, nominally, they're binomial arrays. That is, the amplitude distribution is uh, uh, from the binomial formula for a three element array, that's a one, two, one distribution. And for a four element array, it's a one, three, three, one uh, distribution. For RDF optimization, I've done a, spent a lot of time with EasyNIC, and I've homed in on one, 1 1.84 to 1 and 1 as the distribution rather than a 1, 2, 1. <clears throat> and a 1, 2.4, 2.41 for the amplitude distribution on the four element. That gives a significant improvement in the, uh, in the RDF. <coughs> Excuse me. The performance here, as you add elements, the RDF goes up. And that's uh, uh, achieved a sacrifice of bandwidth, and the uh, the output of the array is basically going down. Three element array, I have it uh, 80 foot space. That's the one that I, I use at uh, my home location, which is uh, I'm on a heavily wooded lot, and uh, the width it's a acre and a quarter, I guess. And so in the one direction, uh, the array is. Uh, 180 feet, I guess, including the ends, 185 feet, something like that. And so I have two of those in orthogonal directions. RDF is 12 and a half dB. That's another uh, 2 dB in this, in this case. And you can really hear 2 dB uh, difference uh, on the uh, signal to noise ratio coming out of these. In fact, I'm going to make a comparison with the short vertical arrays, which a lot of people use as well, the, there's about a six-tenths of a dB advantage for the loop over the vertical version. And that comes from when you build these arrays, there's a, you have the pattern of the individual antenna, and it gets multiplied by the array factor. And so the pattern of the K9AY loop has a little bit of advantage over the vertical because the vertical is omnidirectional. And that shows up as somewhat less than a 1 dB advantage uh, in RDF for the, the loops. And I can hear that all the time on 160. I can hear that all the time. Um, I can hear the difference in the signal to noise ratio when I, before I left the home this morning, I w worked uh, uh, VK3ZL in Australia on 160, and I could hear him clearly on the uh, loop array, and it was noisier on my vertical array. I'll talk about that at the end. Did you, did you use these I think you, you can certainly use the single loop and the two element array. Uh, but each time you go, you get, you're losing five or six dB at a step. And so by the time you get down to minus 35 dB, minus 36 dB output, uh, you're going to need a preamp for sure. I have a, a single 16 dB preamp on these things. So um, that, that'll give you an idea. So you get the improved RDF um, with uh, sacrificing beam width. So by the time you get to the fourth element job, it's up around 15.1 dB, and the beam width is shrunk to 49 degrees. So here's a table that can, looks at all of that. The short vertical here on 80 and uh, 160 by itself is a four point, about 5 dB, the single loop is about uh, two and a half dB above that. Then when we go to the two element array, um, the K9AY on 160 is 10 and a half dB and 10 on 80. Uh, that's using those phasing uh, numbers over there. And uh, this is because I'm using crossfire feed, which I'll talk in a minute ago. So if I use the same uh, phasing line 
and design it for 200 degrees on 160, it turns out to be about 220 on, uh, on 80. And that deteriorates the RDF slightly. If, if I kept 200 degrees on both of these, then these would both be essentially the same number on both bands. But then you've got to switch the phasing lines. And you get 12.5 dB on 160 and 11.3 on 80. And then the new four element array design that uh, I've put together that I'm just testing now, in fact, I haven't been able to make uh, all the, the check the, the phasing and the amplitude, but easy and X says 15 dB. And that's, a, that's another two and a half dB above the uh, three element array. So I'm anxious to really see the performance uh, of it right now. 160 meters is in the tank so badly, it's, uh, you don't get as much opportunity. But uh, come next, uh, next season, this fall, I'll see what it can really do. So there are a couple of things. This is the crossfire phasing. One of the ways to feed the antenna pair if let's, this is just a two element case, you can feed the uh, two element case and just have a single phasing line in there that gives you the phase shift. So you can think of it, if I want 200 degrees of phase shift here, I need a big, pretty good long coax. And um, that, if I go to 80 and I have 200 degrees here in that coax, uh, excuse me, if I'm in 160 and have 200 degrees a phase shift and then go to 80, I've got 400 degrees. And so the thing is just not gonna, uh, gonna work. And uh, WAJI, so this is really a single band solution to do it this way. WAJI came up with the crossfire feed, which is two things happen here. You reverse the end of the feed, and then you get yourself 180 degrees of phase shift with a transformer, and then um, a much shorter, uh, phasing line, the difference between whatever you wanted and 180 degrees. So if I want 200 degrees, I get a 180 degrees out of the uh, transformer and then 20 degrees out of the coax phasing line. So when you go to 80 now, you're, that 20 degree phasing line becomes 40, but it's 180 plus 20, so it's at 220. And that the pattern is still intact. And so you can work these things over at least an octave in frequency and actually more than that. The, 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 uh, uh, it continues to work as you go on up, but starts deteriorating as, that, as the, the overall phase deviates from the re original design. So that's the crossfire feed. The other very, very useful thing in implementing these arrays is the uh, Hybrid, hybrid combiner or Magic T, and this is a very nice thing. It's a transformer, and you combine two antennas, or you can use it as a splitter in the other direction. If you look in either of these ports up here and have this resistor across there that's two times the impedance Z, then you see Z looking in either of, uh, of those two ports. And it combines the signals, and they're completely isolated from each other if the transformer is designed well. There's no interaction between those uh, two ports and no coupling between those two ports. And so out here, you, you get the signal that's uh, those two are added together, basically. And then the impedance level at this point is dropped down to Z over 2. And the... Uh, the controllers that are out there, the DX engineering controller and the high Z controllers, uh, they use multiples of these to do the com combining internally. And they're, it's a really a very, very useful thing. So let's go and take a look at the, the design of one of these. So I'm going to look at the design I'm using right now for that four element array. And it's a uh, a 1, 2.4, 2.4, 1, or if you invert that, it's a 0.42, 1, 1, 0.42. So since I have amplifiers available to have unity gain, then I'm going to uh, set the others to be less than, less than unity. 
So elements one and four are set for a gain of uh, 0.42 minus seven and a half dB, and two and three are set for unity gain or zero dB. And I do that by adjusting the output of resistance of those amplifiers. You don't have to drive the, the coaxis with the, uh, the, the same impedance of the line. You just need to make sure it's terminated in the impedance of the line. So another thing that you'll see on these multi-element arrays is whatever the difference in phase shift is between the first and second element, you just use that over and over again. So from here, I'm, I'm using zero degrees, the second element's at 190 degree phase shift, the third element's at 380, and the fourth element's at 570. It's just multiples of that 190 degree phase shift. And here's where that, you can see the uh, crossfire feed coming into play there. 190 is 180 plus 10, so that'll be going through a, uh, a transformer that's gonna give 180 degrees of phase shift. And the fourth element, is 540 or three times 180 uh, plus 30 degrees. And so these two go through uh, the uh, transformer given 180 degrees of phase shift. And an element three at 380, well that's 360 or zero plus 20. So it doesn't, those, the first and the third element do not go through an inverting transformer and the second and the fourth do. And I'm actually using the uh, DX engineering controller that I have uh, as the combiner in this case because it uh, has exactly that on the inside and uh, it also allows three different phasing lines to be attached. So it was a natural thing. The only problem with it is its internal switching isn't designed to switch these, ar these arrays. It's designed to switch a four square. It's a four square controller. I forgot to mention up there the four square, the, the the three element end fire array, these are all end fire arrays, <clears throat> is you can look at it as a collapsed four square. You've taken the two side elements and added them together in the middle. And so the, I use the four square controllers on the, uh, the three element arrays as well. So the phasing lines are 10, 20, and 30 degrees for this design, and I'm, again, I'm using that four square controller because it, it has exactly the uh, combinations available that, uh, that I need. And so I didn't have to rebuild, didn't have to build my own controller, but I do have to build a network to switch the antennas. Because when you switch, uh, you have to switch ends and you have to switch the in interior ones as well, which doesn't happen with the four square. The four square, Excuse me, the four square is, uh, has an RDF uh, of about 12 and a half dB. It's about, it's there, it's essentially the same uh, as the uh, three element in fire array. Four square gives you four directions, though. So there's the uh, setting it up. I cut the phasing lines based on uh, measuring them with a network analyzer. And uh, it's all set up and working, but I haven't uh, really had a lot of time yet to, to characterize it to make sure the amplitudes and phase, uh, phase shifts are, are correct, that it's uh, built. And here's what the uh, Easy Neck says the, it looks like. And I actually cut out the wrong plot here. It doesn't go out to the edge of the graph like it should. But the, uh, the horizontal pattern there is, is correct. And you can see how the pattern now has been narrowed down greatly in both the horizontal directions as well as uh, the vertical direction. Looks very much like a Yagi. I mean, this thing looks, the patterns look just like you build a four element Yagi there. Except you can't rotate it, except two directions. And I'm using 100 feet between the loops and basically 200, 400, 600, or I've actually gone to 190, 380, 570. The RDF's a little bit better. The thing, the problems you start running into with these is uh, if the, the four element array becomes quite sensitive to phase errors if you, as you narrow the spacing. 
And so I've, I've got it with 100 foot spacing because of that. It, it's much more forgiving for a few degrees of phase error and, and amplitude errors. And it's very similar here on, on uh, 80 meters. So let's look at the construction of these loops a little bit. The original K9AY has a termination resistor on one uh, side that sets the direction. And then it's really doubly terminated. It's terminated on the other side by the coax. Um, <clears throat> but the pattern is set by where that uh, termination resistor is. And I'm just going into the high impedance amplifier input directly and uh, not using a transformer. Since it's a f if the antenna is roughly 500 ohms, the termination resistor is about 500 ohms. And so I just, it's a high impedance an amplifier, uh, not really high, but, but high. So I just go directly into the, to the uh, high impedance amplifiers and they work fine. And there you can see the uh, termination resistor, that's 560 ohms in this case, and a little relay to switch it, switch direction. Uh, one of the th traps I stumbled on in the first one of these I built was that a lot of these high Z amplifiers, are, they're using FETs internally, and the bias voltage for the FET comes right out. There's no capacitive coupling. They're DC coupled, and so there's a voltage on there. And that's fine when you use a vertical. It doesn't care. But when you connect both ends together through a loop, uh, the biasing disappears. Gets all screwed up because you've shorted it out basically to ground. Okay, so I built the, my first uh, loop array that I built. I hooked it all up and I was all excited and uh, and it didn't work and I couldn't figure out what was going wrong and that's because I had all the amplifiers shorted out by the loops. <clears throat> so I use a, just a simple two by four support there and. Uh, and here we have the direction control, and here's the high Z plus four amplifier. And I use both um, fiberglass poles and, uh, and or aluminum poles as my uh, support. I have not seen any interaction uh, between the aluminum supports and the loops. Um, and uh, very, very forgiving things. You, you throw them up, and uh, they seem to work. That this, by the way, is out in a field. In the, the older talks that I've given the last couple of years, that you can see the array at my house buried in the trees and get an idea for what it is. This is a part of a remote array, and that's where the four element job is being uh, put together, is being uh, tested right now. It's across town at a, in, on a farm where we have a, a club station. And there you can see, looking from the center, over there on the right, looking from the center where the controller is on down to the east, uh, northeast more or less. And there are two uh, antennas down that way. They're so much in line you can hardly see the second one. And then this is the individual loop. Um, these are using fiberglass poles here. And this is looking from one end down to the other end, actually. And they're lined up. And uh, they're also f reasonably close to the transmitting antenna on the other bands, and it doesn't uh, seem to affect things much either. I, the, the, the loops are really very forgiving in that way, in many ways. So I'm using that DXE controller, uh, four, four high Z plus six amplifiers. You got to switch the terminations with the controller direction and you've got to switch the inputs to the controller. You know, I'm not actually switching the controller direction, I'm just switching the inputs to the controller. And I've got common mode chokes all over the place to, uh, to uh, keep common mode signal problems out of it. So there's sort of a block diagram of the, the four element array. So let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons here. The, the verticals are e easier to install. Short verticals arrays are easier to install. And basically, you don't have to worry about switching the loops. 
the omnidirectional pattern, you just switch the, the controller, the phase in, and you switch the direction. So you've got to do a little bit more work to switch the arrays. The vertical footprint is somewhat smaller. Um, the center to center, the so spacing, let's say, is the same. Well, with the loops, you've got another 15 feet in each direction at the end. For me, I have had a lot of variability with uh, my, uh, I started out with a, a four square, short vertical four square. And it worked part of the time, and it didn't work so well some of the time, or a lot of the time. And I went to the loops and found that the, the, the loop arrays seemed to be more consistent for me. There's the adage, though, on low bands that you can never have too many antennas. None of these antennas works great all the time. Like right now, talking to Australia in the mornings, now I hear best on my transmit vertical. It's just the time of the year when the signals come in from high angle on the low bands. And, uh, and essentially this morning was the only time I heard better on the loop on a on the short vertical array than I did on the loop array. The, the short verticals were slightly better and that's because actually, I think because the vertical arrays have better high angle performance. You saw that the, the lobe is really compressed on the, the loop arrays in the multi-element versions on the, my three element version and uh, makes a big difference. The loops have a slight advantage and indeed I can uh, hear that advantage. Uh, the simulation also says there's a large output advantage, but I haven't found that, and I finally figured out why it is. These high in impedance amplifiers are high impedance amplifiers, and they basically insert a large impedance in series with the feed point of the vertical. And if you put that high impedance into easy neck and model it, voila, the output drops from plus 1 dB to minus 30 dB. So that's, that's it, the source of the uh, uh, difference in the outputs. So here's again a summary of those. You can look at that. I'm going to, here's uh, the other experiment that's underway. I've, I've mentioned it several times that I'm comparing short verticals to K9AY. What I've done at home now, this is the three element array. This is one of the supports on the three element array one of the three element arrays, and that's the aluminum support. And so I use those three aluminum supports as a three element vertical array. They're 26 foot verticals. I wanted to make a comparison here, a direct comparison between these things. And so I did some simulation and found that uh, the vertical supports don't seem to affect the loops, but the loops affect the pattern of the verticals. Uh, so I found by experiment with Easy Neck that if I float the loops when I'm using the verticals, then the pattern's okay. So, yeah. Based on your table that you went by real fast, okay. Two and three elements are 80 feet apart, and the four element is 100 feet apart. Yeah, I didn't put that in there. I don't think the simulation here, oh, no, they're all 85 feet apart. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah, no, you're right. So what I said is correct. These, this is a one. These both are 80 feet, and that's the 100 foot. So there is some variable variation there. So I can switch instantaneously between the uh, short vertical array and the loop array, three element. And it's been, it was in operation through this year's uh, good season, all through from late in the fall, all through now. And first thing that I was surprised, I can, truly hear the difference in six-tenths of a dB signal to noise ratio. I wasn't sure whether it's going to make any difference or not, but it, it definitely seems to. And except for two times, there are actually two times on VK3ZL signal that the, I could hear him better on the, the uh, vertical array than on the loop array. 
But in both those cases, I could hear best on the transmitting inverted L. So it was the horizontal component probably on the inverted L that, that was uh, doing the best for it. So I made the several of those comments. Again, I have to float the loop so it doesn't screw up the vertical array pattern. I can hear that front to back is typically better on the loop array. When I switch back and forth directions, it's better in the loop arrays. And the output of my loop array is actually higher than that of the vertical array by a, by a little bit. It's not, not, it might be a couple of dB. And again, that's because of the, uh, the um, high impedance that's in, this, in series with the, the verticals uh, from the amplifiers. So I hear well on the low bands. Uh, and it's really a big advantage in DX contests in the NAQP. Uh, I usually do very, very well with multipliers in the NAQP, for example. Uh, I get a lot of multipliers on 80 and 160 in the last uh, hour of the contest uh, that other people. And so I, I'm often outscoring people that have more QSOs than I do because I'm getting a lot of, I can hear well on, on 160 and people can hear me apparently as well. It's really interesting. Um, an example of the, the next comment there is uh, uh, HC2AQ was on, HC2AO, I've forgotten. Just a couple of nights ago, they were headed for uh, uh, HD8. And I couldn't hear them on my transmit antenna, and I flicked it to the south uh, uh, three element array, and the signal just popped right up out of there, and the front to back was tremendous on, on him, on, on my verticals, on my uh, loop array. And I really couldn't hear him on my transmit vertical at all. The gain in the front to back are really, really show up. Unfortunately, you can't rotate it. And so you have to look at what you're trying to do very carefully. You really need to care, uh, worry about the spatial bandwidth in these arrays because you either have to put multiples of them up or you can't hear in certain directions. The RDF goes down a great, great deal. Uh, in fact, for contesting, I would probably suggest a uh, uh, pair of two element arrays like I talked about last year. And you can do this either with a four square or two two element arrays, and that is the RDF again deteriorates as you go off toward 45 degrees, let's say, on these things. Well, if you take the no north south one and the east west one and combine them, you pull the RDF back up in the 45 degree directions to within a half a dB of what it is in the preferred directions. So that's what I was using remotely for, for quite a while, is uh, a pair of two element arrays with the 10 and a half dB RDF. And uh, so it's 10 and a half dB in the preferred directions, and then when you combine the two off at 45 degrees, it's 10 dB. So you lose about a half a dB there. And for general contest work, I think that's really sufficient. Uh, you're not going to be spending the time digging out the really, really weak signals on the low bands. But if you can get the advantage of the arrays, and 10, D, uh, 10 dB RDF is a significant improvement over a single, uh, let's say, a vertical on, uh, on 160. So you really need to think about this issue. Uh, if you take, for example, if you take a four, three element array, and it's got 13, 12 and a half, or even you can design it for 13 dB RDF in the preferred direction, by the time you get off to 45 degrees, it's gonna be sit down six dB. Um, it's just like a single loop at that point, unless you're combined. I, I, use, I use that same trick. I combine both of my three element arrays to improve the RDF off at, uh, at 45 degrees, so. 
And you can do that there. I just ran across a paper on a four square short vertical array where you can switch it in eight directions by using it as four square and then in the 45 degrees directions you use it as a broadside end fire array. Uh, and uh, so you get, you probably lose a half a dB in the, uh, in the broadside end fire directions because of the spacing. And once again, I use it wherever it works, okay? If I'm having noise problems, 10 meters, can't hear the signal because my wife turned on the mixer or something, I, <laughs> I turn on that loop and see if I can hear them. And sometimes yes and sometimes no. And here's a bunch of uh, references to look at, places to look. And thank you very much. I'll take some more questions. Uh, where did I put the chokes? So I have common mode chokes out here in these lines that aren't drawn there between the high Z amplifiers and the, uh, the uh, control box. And then uh, coming out of the, uh, uh, this is the switch box. Here they are. This is the group of them. All common mode chokes here. And then not shown because it was running off the screen. I have a pair of common mode chokes there. So I've got them in each of the individual antenna lines and then in the, the line going to the, tran to the receiver. Yeah, you can never, uh, never have too many low band antennas. Is what uh, what it turns out to be. I think. Yeah. What did you find when you uh, rotated your four your uh, loops? Did uh, that give you an advantage? Yeah, so you can electronically rotate it eight directions then by just adding them. That's an easy way to go. Any other questions? Ah, one in the back. Uh, it's available through Tim's website and it's also available on my website k4iqj.com and k3lr.com both of them you're going next door i am yes for a, a q and a next okay door.